51, an exhortation to action. The, the first verse starts off with um, the phrase, listen to me. Listen to me. This is God speaking to Israel. Uh, Rahab, <clears throat> which is Egypt. Uh, Sarah, Abraham's wife. The places in Jerusalem. Uh, and he's saying, listen to me. Now, there's a whole message right there in itself. Listen to me. From the very beginning in Genesis, God told Adam and Eve, listen, of all the trees that I've created, and there are thousands, thousands of trees, from the walnut, maybe I should have said from the apple tree to the walnut tree, you know, thousands upon thousands of trees, and you have berry trees and shrubs and, you know, all kinds of herbs, and listen, but this one tree... Don't eat of it. Thousands, thousands of trees. But this one, listen, don't eat of it. And they said, which one? Which one are you talking about? That one? Why not? They didn't listen, did they? They didn't hear the heart of God. Because it wasn't a command to keep them away from something great or good. Not at all. It was a command to keep them away from trouble, from heartache. From disaster, and they didn't hear that in God. You would have thought as they approached the tree, you know, I'm sure day after day, you know, well, there's that tree. Okay, let's go, let's go hit the 900 tree that we've already tried of, you know. We still have 100 to go, but there's that tree over there. You see it? Yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay, okay, well, let's stay away from it, you know. But eventually they got closer as the enemy came about, and he started to entice them and, and draw them closer, and there they were before the tree. You know, and, and Eve, listening to the enemy, took of that tree. And you think at that moment that she would have heard her husband's voice. God said, don't eat that tree. That she would have listened. You know, she would have listened. She would have heard his heart. That God said, don't eat of that tree. Because if we eat of that tree, there will be destruction. There will be pain. There will be suffering. You know, a warning. You know, red lights should have went off. The, the yellow ribbon and the flag should have been waving. But she didn't listen. The pleasure and temptation was too much for her. And so she gave in. And of course then Adam, you know, when she brings the fruit to him and says, look, try it, it's good. It's really good. You would think again, the red flags, ding, 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 you know, fireworks and so forth. God said, listen, you're not listening. And he ate of the, the fruit. God calls us to listen. Uh, many of us have been saved in a, a very awesome way, you know, an extreme way. God took hold of our, our hearts uh, in radical ways <clears throat> where we realized that we were sinners and we fell short of God's glory, that we really deserved to go to hell because of the sins that we committed, especially us that were older and we kind of experienced life a little bit in those temptations that were out there, we partook of them. We should realize that um, we didn't listen to God and we followed after our own desires and passions and hungers. And, and we saw the struggles with it all and the heartaches that it brought. And then God saves us. And once He saves us, He asks us to listen, to listen to His heart, to pay attention, to hear, to hear the very heart of God. How do you do that? Can you hear God's heart? Can you hear Him whispering when He directs and guides you? Can you hear Him telling you to stay away from that? Can you hear Him giving you priorities and directing you in life? Can you really hear Him? Can you hear the heart behind all of that? Because the heart behind God is a heart of love. For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. It's a heart of love. And God is love, the Bible says. There is no other ulterior motive but love for us, protection, for prosperity, for those things that are good for us. That's all God has in mind for us is love, prosperity, protection, the best of the best. If you hear his heart, that's all it is. And yet we think that he's holding something back. Because there's an area that maybe we're tempted with that we want to experience or we have an idea that that's the best way to go. And God is saying, don't do it. Listen. We need to sharpen that listening tool, don't we? 
How do we do that? Well, it takes time. It takes time uh, away from the world. It takes time away from yourself. It takes time away from your family. It takes time to get away into your prayer closet in the dark and in the middle of the night and finding that place secluded from everything else, all the ringtones and games and all that stuff that we get involved with and, and American Idol and television and all that and just saying, Lord, I want to listen to your heart. I just want to hear you. I want to hear the beat. Boom. 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 And know that that's you speaking to me. And it means getting away. It means spending time with him and really listening to his voice. Because he does want to speak to us. And so in this chapter, he's calling the children of Israel to action. Uh, They've been put into bondage in Babylon. They're living like the Babylonians. They're assimilating into the culture. They're into idolatry. And he's trying to get their attention to wake up and to listen and to live for God. Because God has a plan for them. God hasn't forsaken them. God hasn't turned his back on them. God still loves them. The same God that created the heavens and the earth is the God that loves them still. The God that saved the, the Israelites from Egypt is the God that wants to save them from Babylon. And even though God had delivered them into Babylon to teach them a lesson, he also wants to deliver them out of Babylon to set them back in their home. You know, we see that in in Ezra, the the great work of God there, when Cyrus became king. And the Israelites went to him and said, look, um, look it up. You'll find records and and you'll see that uh, Jerusalem is ours and we're asking you to send us. And he was just so excited about it. He knew God somehow. And he said, go back. And I'll give you the resources that you need. In fact, I will return everything that was taken from you and and restore it to you. And they went back to Jerusalem and they were building the temple of God again. There was such a passion and love because they heard the voice of God to do it. And so they returned back and did it. Now, opposition came in, right? We know that the scripture tells us that. Chapter 8 or 9, somewhere around there where it says that those people that were half Jews, that were left behind, that had lived there, came and they saw what they were doing, and they asked, what are you guys doing, and who gave you permission to do so? And we'd like to help you in this situation. And of course they says, no, you're half Jews, you're, no, you're not really a part of us, we won't allow you to come in, desecrate the, the temple of God, this is God's work, and it's going to be his work and not your work, and they got offended by that. Then they began to harass them and, and discourage them. In fact, they wrote a letter to the king and said, hey, if you really look it up, you'll find out that this God of Israel has always caused problems for other kings. And so they did, they looked it up. And they saw that God had always caused problems to kings that are always causing problems to Israel because God protected his children. And they saw how many times that God would protect the children of Israel from Egypt, uh, when they went around Jericho, from Ai, and all the surrounding kings that were in battle, and God always protected them. And they listened. And of course they won. They stopped building and waited for quite a bit of time. And then they repetitioned the king and said, look, go back and listen to what Cyrus said. And the king read what happened and they said, go ahead and do it again. See, God is always working. Even when there's opposition, even when the enemy wants to destroy us, he is working in our lives. We need to listen. We need to listen. And maybe you've lost that listening power. One way to lose that, uh, the Paul tells us that we need to not quench the Spirit of God. The word quench means that, that we kind of put the fire out. You, know, you, you ever get a roaring fire, and at the end of the day, you're ready to go home from the beach or wherever you have this fire, and so now you've got to put the fire out. And so you throw some water on it, you quench the fire. And of course, it's still smoldering a little bit, you know, so you throw some dirt on top of it. But still, underneath the dirt, it's still smoldering. And some of us are there where it's still smoldering, it's still a little warm, but there's no fire, there's no passion, because we're not listening. We've lost the, the hearing sense, uh, the call to action sense. We're not taking what we have learned and putting it into action in our lives. Even when the enemy is in opposition to us, how much more we should be listening to God and knowing that greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And call to action. God is calling us. But we listen to the world. And we hear the world. And we're enticed by the world. And so it gets in the way and it quenches the spirit of God. We need to wake up. And we need to retune 
that channel to the Lord. Listen to me, he says in verse 1, you who follow after righteousness. Now this is for those who are following God, that hunger for righteousness, that thirst after the living God. Righteousness, living a right life before God. Listen to what God is saying, you who seek the Lord. And God promised us uh, in Matthew, Jesus even said, look, if you ask, you know, you'll find. If you, if, or if you ask, I'll give it to you. If you seek, you'll find it. If you knock, I'll open the door, right? For those who seek the Lord, look to the rock, that's Jesus Christ, from which you were hewed, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. So again, he's saying, look to the rock, look to Jesus. We'll find references in Isaiah uh, of Jesus Christ quite a few times here. Look from where you came from, Jesus Christ, our Savior. He birthed us, right? Unless you're born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, Paul said it this way, unless you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, you know, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Paul said in Galatians, it's not the circumcision, but it's the circumcision of the heart that matters, right? It's the changed heart. Are you listening? Are you hearing what God is saying? It's the changed heart in you because we're hewed from the rock. That is the rock of Christ. And he says, let me give you the evidence. Look at the promises that I gave to Abraham and to Sarah. And did they come true? Of course they did. Look at how I blessed them, how they increased. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like a garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Notice what he says here. The Lord will comfort Zion. That is Jerusalem. He will comfort you. He will make her wilderness like Eden. The desert like the garden. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Now, do we see that in Israel today? Not really. Right now, they're preparing because of what's going on with Iraq. You know, we pull our troops out, and sure enough, we knew that was going to happen, right? Uh, peace and peace, but yet there's never peace, the Bible says. And here, here we, we liberated Iraq, set up a force for them, and almost immediately, um, ISIS, ISIS comes in and wipes them all out just that quick. Takes over the, the oil fields. You know, our prices are going to go up, but who cares about that? Um, the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, now, Israel is preparing possibly for attack because not only is ISIS a part of the Islamic uh, terrorist group, but they have nuclear weapons. The possibility of them attacking Israel and Iran helping them out is great there. Are you hearing what God is preparing us for? He's preparing us for something. But we don't see this happening today. We see wars and rumors of wars. We, we see these things taking place and we should be rejoicing inside. But Israel, one day, when the tribulation comes, and at the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes and brings judgment upon the world, there will be a time of reigning, a millennium, a thousand years, where they truly will see the wilderness turn like Eden and the desert like a garden. And joy and gladness will be found in thanksgiving and the voice of melody because then they'll see their Savior face to face. And they will know that Jesus is the Messiah. They will know that he is the Messiah. It's interesting, um, when I was in Israel, uh, my tour guide or our tour guide, his name was Yossi, and really knowledgeable person of the scriptures well, I heard uh, they just went to Israel in, in May, another couple of groups, Calvary Chapels and so forth. And apparently uh, somebody was talking about the, the return of the Messiah, the end times and what was going on. And Yossi made a statement that, that was pretty interesting to me because I had uh, tried to witness to him several years ago, actually in 2003. And Yossi made this statement, no, the Christian Messiah hasn't come yet. And so he understood that the Bible spoke about the Christian Messiah, that is, Jesus has not come back yet, that that needs to happen before the end of all things takes place. When that end of all things take place, then Israel will see that Jesus is the Christian Messiah, that he is the Messiah of the Jews also, and that he took 
Israel, uh, his people, chosen people, and then he took the Gentiles, the church, and he made them into one, and that Jesus is our Messiah, their Messiah and our Messiah together. And then there will be great rejoicing. He says, listen, and he says this several times, verse 4, listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for law will proceed from me, and I will make my just rest as a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the people. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. Now that's the judgment of God coming upon them. It, he wasn't talking in the near future, he was talking about the far future. We see this in first or second Peter's chapter three, right? When Peter talks about the earth and what will happen to the earth. And we'll get to it in a couple of weeks when we start Second Peter. We'll finish up First uh, Peter this coming Sunday. But notice what he talks about here, how the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those that are on it will die. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. The way of the Lord is forever. His salvation is forever. One day, after the tribulation period and after the millennium reign, this earth will put on a new earth. Peter says that in the day of the Lord, it will be like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, with a great noise. Now we know the earth is deteriorating. We know scientifically that the earth is, is slowing down in its speed. And we know that through the seasons and the disasters that... Um, that things are not progressing, but they're digressing. They're getting worse. We know solar flares are going out from the sun. We know that there's a meteor that's on its way towards Earth that NASA has already uh, talked about and so forth. So everything seems to be coming to an end and not necessarily speeding up and progressing to a greater future. And Peter says that when the heavens pass away, there's going to be a, a great noise that will take place. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now, you can only imagine what that's like. There's a place out here on Etiwanda. They make uh, aluminum. It's a hard word to say, but I said it right. My granddaughter has been helping me with that word forever. Aluminum. <laughs> they melt it. They melt it. And if you ever go here, you get an opportunity just kind of park and you can actually look in, in, in the Bay Area and you can see this red hot molten uh, aluminum being melted. Uh, I've walked in there and you can literally breathe the heat in. You can see all the black dust all over the, on the floors, on the walls, on the ceilings. It's just everywhere because they're melting this aluminum. <laughs> I have to say that slow, otherwise I won't get it right. And, and you look in that little fire, and I mean, it is red. It is an orange red with a white hue around it because it's so hot. It's so hot. Can you imagine the earth being that way? Melt with fervent heat, kind of like the sun, you know, where it's melting away, literally melting, you know, melting away slowly. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So Peter's encouragement here, again, listen, listen to what God is saying here because we get the wrong idea. We think, oh, God's going to bring judgment. Oh, these bad people, these wicked men, these, the, the, these individuals that have caused so much problems for Christians and, 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 you know, and ruined worlds and killed people. And, and yet God is going to judge them all and ha, 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 and they're going to be in the fire forever and ever and ever. That's not God's heart, though, is it? God told us very clearly that he wished that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's his heart. But we don't listen to his heart. And so Peter's here talking about what will happen to the earth, what will happen in the end, but he's really, what he's really saying is listen to what God is saying here. Look, since we understand this and know this, what kind of life should we be living? That's his point. What kind of life should we as believers should be living? 
We should be living godly life, righteous lives. That's what God is telling Isaiah here. Wake up. A call to action. Stop being lukewarm. God will spit you out. But he doesn't want you lukewarm. He doesn't want to spit you out. He wants to have a heart after him that's in love with him because he loves you. Don't get caught up in the judgment. Don't get caught up in what he's going to do. Get caught up in the love to protect you and warn you. Get caught up in that. Listen to what he's saying because it's coming. And Peter's telling us right there what, ought, what conduct should we be living. Look, looking for the hasting of the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promises, look for a new heaven, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. See, that's the heart of God. Yeah, this stuff's going to come. Yeah, it's going to be bad. And and because people rejected Christ, yeah, they're going to have to kind of suffer along with it. But those that know the Lord, a new heaven, a new earth, and will dwell there in righteousness, once and for all, finally, praise the Lord, Listen to what he's saying here. He goes on in verse 7. Listen to me. Again, there's that word. Listen to me. Hear my heart. Do you hear his heart? Do you hear the beat? Because it's beating for you. It's beating for you. You who know righteousness. Now, now those who hunger for righteousness, now knows who... No righteousness. It's one thing to hunger and to know righteousness. I think a lot of us know righteousness. We know the Ten Commandments. You know, you know you shouldn't be lying. You know you shouldn't be stealing. You know you should keep the Sabbath holy. You know you ought to honor your father and mother. We know all those things, but then to do them is different, isn't it? To apply it to our lives is really the struggle that we all go through. How do we do that? Oh, you get in love with God. You get in love with God. When you're in love with somebody, you'll do anything. You'll do anything. When I met my wife, there wasn't anything I wouldn't do. I, I, I still remember that day. I was in junior high, seventh grade. And I had they had lockers back then. My uh, granddaughter said, oh, I wish we had lockers. It would be so nice. And started carrying the book bags and all the books with you. We had lockers of our own combination. And I remember seeing Virginia, my, my wife now. And, and there I was opening up my locker. I don't remember my combination, but I was going right, you know, then left. And then all of a sudden, in the corner of my eye, I see this beautiful blonde coming around the corner. And literally, it was like slow motion, just whew, her hair blowing. Whew, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my. What fell down from heaven? Wow. I mean, this is, oh, and just slowly, and uh, she's coming closer to me, and I'm like, oh, getting nervous now. You know, I'm trying to remember my, and I couldn't get my locker open, and she's like two or three lockers down from me, and I was in love. That was it. I, she caught me, though she wasn't even trying. She didn't even know me, you know, but she caught me. I, I was just in love, and there wasn't anything that I wouldn't do for her. Because I was in love with her. And then when she got invited to a birthday party in 8th grade that I was invited to in 8th grade. And there she was again. And she was the flirt too. I mean, you know, I was the shy, glasses, you know, nerdy type of guy. You know, just kind of, you know, didn't say much. And she was the jumping up and down teenage girl, you know, that's just all over the place. You, know, you want to dance? I'm like, I don't know how to dance. No, I don't want to dance. Come on, come on. She's dragging me and pulling me. You know, and she hooked me again. You know, and so I I was in love, and there wasn't anything that, that I wouldn't do there. One time, we're on our way home from my house. You know, we're walking hand in hand, and we're going up there from Roland Heights, uh, getting onto Fullerton Road, and going to head up to Galatina, where she lived, about two miles or so uh, up up the way uh, south from from my house. And and so we're walking, and all of a sudden, there's a little gopher snake. So I'm like, oh, don't worry, I got it, babe. And so I reached down and look, let me show you how you catch a snake. And I ripped like that, and it bit me. And I'm like, ah, I'm screaming and yelling. I'm like, oh, no. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. I got to go. See you later. (laughs) And I ran home, had to go to the hospital and get tetanus shots and all that because I didn't know what what it was, what kind of snake it was. And So she had to walk all the way home. But I wanted to show her how strong I was, what a man I was, you know. And the snake bites me. I mean, there's nothing that you won't do for God when you're in love with God. 
We need to be in love with God because he loves us. His heart beats for us and we need to beat for him. He's done so much for us. You who know righteousness and you people in whose heart is my law. Uh, there's a big difference. The heart is in the law. Uh, the law is in the heart and not necessarily written on the wall. You know, the big difference. When Moses brought those Ten Commandments down and all of a sudden he looks and he sees the people and they're all sinning, he's like, well, obviously they don't care about God's law and he just threw them on the ground they broke up, you know. But if the law was in their hearts, they didn't need the, the tablets. They would not have been sinning because the law was in their hearts. How could I do this to because I'm in love with him. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. So love me more, fear me more than men. Don't worry about men. Don't worry about what they think of you. We, we do that so much. Oh, we want to impress them so much. We, we want, and there's people that literally will lie all the time because they just want to impress. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You find out their family's all messed up. Just, well, how are you financially? Oh, man, we're prospering like crazy, and they're in debt up, up to their nose and higher. You know? And they just want to lie because it's an image. It's just this facade that they put on to, to make themselves feel like they're okay and, and so forth. And, and men aren't okay. I mean, we can't trust them. We need to trust God and God alone. You know? For the moth will eat them up like garments, and the worm will eat them like wool. And of course, it's talking about Gehenna, right? What Jesus said, you know, the worm will not die and the fire will not be quenched. But my righteousness will be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. Thank God for that. You know, thank God that, that his salvation didn't end at the hippie movement. You know, that, that it waited a few years and then I got saved. And even today, salvation is still there and it's nearer than ever before. And if we just call on the name of the Lord, we'll be saved. He's so faithful. And all the way up to the very end, to the day that you're in the bed. And how many times I've gone to hospitals with men in the bed ready to die and they ask the Lord into their heart. My brother-in-law, he was 33 years old and he thought he was having ulcers. And they kept treating him as though he had ulcers. Well, it wasn't ulcers, it was stomach cancer. And so by the time uh, they really found out it was too late, he was in the hospital. They weren't quite sure how bad it was yet. I went in there immediately. When you're in the hospital, I'm going to preach to you. So I started preaching to him about what Christ has done for him. And, and he needs to ask Christ into his heart, you know, because we don't know the day or the hour. He could come back now. Are you ready? And he started screaming, Mom, Dad, get him out of here. Tell him to leave. I mean, top of his lungs, he did not want me there. And so I just walked away and I felt rejection of the Lord. So I walked out. I didn't go back after that. <clears throat> and then they opened him up and they closed him back up. It was too late. It was so much cancer they couldn't do anything about it. Closed him back up. They sent him home. His wife calls me up and she says, what do I do? He wants to know the Lord. See, because he's at that point now, he knows it's too late. There's nothing he could do. And so I told him, Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 8, for by grace, put his name in there, you, Chris, have been saved through faith, Chris. And it's not of your works, Chris. It's a gift of God, Chris. And if you believe, you'll be saved, Chris. So she did that, and he accepted Christ in her heart. I walked her through on the phone. And when he passed away, she said she was holding his hands. And the last words he said to her was, I'll see you later. I'll see you later. That's faith. I'll see you in heaven. And she looked down at his hand, and there was a little cross that appeared. And as he passed away, it disappeared, just as a sign that, that he was there with the Lord. Some people wait till the very last minute, but God's salvation is there if you call on the name of the Lord. He, verse, verse 9 says, Awake, awake, put on strength. O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Now, the people here are calling on God. Do something now. <laughs> I, I, we're fickled, aren't we? We're, we're just fickled people. I mean, <laughs> when we're in trouble, we're calling on God. 
You know, it's when we're in trouble or we need something, we're calling on God. Or when something happens, we're going, well, where are you? <laughs> where were you? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why, why aren't you awake? I mean, have, are you sleeping somewhere and you don't see what's going on? And God's like, man, I've been, around, I've been here the whole time, just waiting on you, just loving on you. You're still breathing, aren't you? You still have breath, right? You're still healthy, right? You're still alive, right? I mean, you're still eating. Got a roof over your head, right? Well, who's providing all that? I am. We forget. As soon as we get into trouble, oh, wait, God, where are you? Where's your strength? Don't you remember when you uh, crushed the serpent's head, you know, and all of this stuff? Where are you now? Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of great depth, that made the depth of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? Didn't you part the Red Sea for the children of Israel? You did that, didn't you? That was a miracle when you think about it. It's interesting. I was watching a documentary on this, and there's some guys that think they know where it is that they crossed over. I have a problem with that because it's kind of north there of of the Red Sea, and there's a, a piece of land that's a little higher than the rest, and they think that that's where they crossed over when the when the water just kind of uh, you know subsided, and then they crossed over and then it came back. Well, the problem is, and here's the problem that I have every time someone comes up with an idea: How did Pharaoh and all his chariots and horsemen go in there? Even if the water came back, it might have been three or four or five feet high. How did they all drown? They all drowned. That's a greater miracle. I mean, there would have been a few left, but the Bible says they all drowned. No, I think God parted the sea in the deepest part just so we could know that he can do that. And he parted it, and as the children of Israel went through and Pharaoh and them went through, it just came on them, and not one of them survived. Not one of them survived. We're always trying to think of a scientific way of it happening. You know what? It's a miracle. God can do anything. He can create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. It's like these scientists, they think that they're God. There's a story of scientists who thought, well, I think we did it. We created proteins. We're like God. So God all of a sudden speaks to him and says, so you think you're like me, huh? Tell you what. Let's have a contest. Let's see if you can create something. And so God takes some dirt, puts it together, and creates this little animal, runs around. And the scientist says, oh, great. So the scientist grabs some dirt, and then God says, oh, hold on. Get your own dirt. What? No, I made the dirt. No, you go get your own dirt. You go make your own. You can't. You can't. You can't. God redeemed them as they crossed over the Red Sea. So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion and sing, verse 11, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I even, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of man? Who will die, and the Son of Man, who will be made like grass? And you forget the Lord, your Maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor. Uh, Babylon was oppressing them greatly, and so they had great fear of their oppressor every day. The load and the burden upon their elderly, upon their children, upon them themselves was too much. And they were calling out upon God. And God's reminding them who he is. When he has prepared to destroy, and where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hasten, that he may be loosed. That he should not die in the pit, and that his bread shall not fail. But I am the Lord your God who divided the sea, whose waves roared, and Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my word in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are my people. You are my people. I I love it when he says phrases like that. You are my people. Or when David says, he is my God. Because he is. That's personal, isn't it? And some think that God is not a personal being, and he's an impersonal being. That, that he's, He decided to make everything and then kind of step away and say, okay, you go ahead and finish the process. No, God is very active in our lives. He's very personal. And the children of Israel are not done with. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that think 
that God has done with Israel, and so they don't support Israel. They're looking for Iran and these nations to abolish Israel, to pretty much push them into the Mediterranean Sea and destroy them, and yet God's not going to allow that. You watch and see what's going to happen with Iraq right now and what's going on over there, and if they try to attack Israel. You watch and see how God will protect them. That in itself, if you look at the nation Israel, should strengthen your faith in God. It really should. Because all of the nations that existed during the time of Israel no longer exist. They're gone. Israel has been, they say, the most persecuted nation of all. Now, there's been other nations that have been persecuted probably more, all the way to extinction. And we know that because they're no longer here. The Jebusites and, and so forth, Amorites, they're no longer existing. They're gone. There's no ancestry there whatsoever. They're gone. They're cut off. So up to that point during the time of Israel is, is the only people that will ever exist. Nothing afterwards will ever see in heaven. We will only talk to the ancestors back then that if they made it to heaven, you know, they're gone. But Israel is still here. Why? Because they're his people. He loves them very much. And so if Israel is loved by God, then how much more does he love the church? How much more does he love you? Do you hear his heart beating for you? Listen to what he's saying. Wake up. He says in verse 17, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of the trembling and drained it out. Again, the judgment of God. There is no one to guide her among all the sons she has brought forth, nor is there any who takes her hand or by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. These two things have come to you. Who will be sorry for you? Desolation and destruction, famine and sword. By whom will I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets like an antelope in a net. You can only imagine that. The, the oppression upon them, uh, an antelope caught in a net, you know, the struggle that takes place there, right? You know, you, it's, it's not necessarily just taking a gun and shooting the antelope and it dies, but literally it's in a net. I saw a little video, you might have seen it posted on Facebook, where a, I believe it was a sperm whale was caught in one of these nets, and it, it was a baby one. And it was so wound in this net that it was just floating in the water and these fishermen came by and they started to cut the net away from him because he couldn't even swim, couldn't use his fins, nothing. He was going to die. Started cutting away, cutting away, cutting away, cutting away. Finally had the tail end of it left and he kept kind of swimming off and swimming off. So they chased it you know, down until finally they were able to get that net off of them. But it struggled for hours. I think it was a good, good six to eight hours that they were cutting this thing, you know, the net away from them. Finally, they got the net completely off, and boy, that whale literally went into the water, started jumping out of the water, and putting on a show for them, like, thank you, guys, you know, and just swimming and jumping and flipping and doing all kinds of neat things. Here, they're like that. They're caught in this net, and they're struggling. You imagine the hooves, you know, caught inside the nets, and they're moving around, and they can't move their their anchors are, are caught and they're just struggling the whole time. That's what bondage is all about. When we get into sin, when we live our own lives, we're in a net and we're caught by that net. We think we're free, but we're not. We're not free at all. You know, that's why we have the struggles. That's why there's that movement and what's going on and why is this happening and why does my life seem to be falling apart but you're pretending like everything's okay and you're jumping up and down rejoicing and trying to put this facade when the whole time you're in a net. Because you know, you hear God and you know what's right because He's touched your heart at one point or another and you know that. But you're in a net. You need to get free of that stuff. Get rid of it and just serve the Lord. Get active and get busy with the things of God. These two things have come to you, he said. Verse 21, Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. So uh, that interesting phrase, you can imagine what it's like being drunk with wine, but not with wine. <clears throat> the, the silliness, the, you know, there used to be a phrase in my time, used to be, you're an airhead. You know, that means there's nothing up there. You know, you're just blank. Thus says the Lord, or your Lord, the Lord and your God, who pleads 
the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dreads of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it, but I will put it into the hand of those who afflicted you, who have said to you, lie down, that we may walk over you. And you have laid your body like the ground and as the street for those who walk over you. Again, you, you hear God, look, you're being afflicted, you're caught in this net, but I have freedom for you. I have set you free. I have something greater. And one day I will totally set you free. I was reading an article um, just the other day about someone that was in bondage. <clears throat> and in this article, it basically simply said this, Continue to walk with the Lord and continue to confess your sins before Him every day until He delivers you. And that is so true. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6. Uh, Romans 7, also in, in chapter 8, verse 1. The no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You know, when we're in struggling, when we're in that net, you continue to seek God. You confess it every day. You, you try to resist it as much as you can. And you keep doing it. And if you fall down, you get back up. If you fall down, you get back up. You fall down, you get back up. And you just keep going forward. Because God will restore you. That's this whole process, trying to restore you. He understands that we're fallen men. We're sinful. It's in our nature. And he's going to give us strength to defeat it one day. But we have to seek Him and seek after Him and battle against the flesh. Now He calls them to strength in chapter 52. To put on strength. Awake, awake. Again, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. The holy city for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Now, again, these are, are future events. At this point, Israel is still struggling against the enemy, and they will continue to struggle until the Lord comes back. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. Now, that's an interesting phrase there. Isaiah is saying, look, this is what the Lord said. You've sold yourself. Now, when you sell yourself, usually you expect to get something, right? Even a, even a prostitute you know, that sells herself gets something, whatever it is, gets some sort of monetary you know, benefit from it. You know? And yet here, God is saying, look, you sold yourself thinking you're going to get something, but really you got nothing. You got nothing. And yet you shall be redeemed without money. Now, redeem, redemption, Goal, kinsman redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, he's the nearest kins. Jesus didn't pay money to redeem us. He paid his life to redeem us. It was his blood that redeemed us without money. And so he's saying here, look, you sold yourself and you got nothing. But I'm not going to pay a penny for you. I'm going to give my life for you. It's one thing to pay someone's debt. But boy, are you committed when you give your life for that person? You sure are, aren't you? It's a lot more valuable to the one who has been redeemed when you realize that person gave his life for you. Uh, we, we see it all the time. You know, whether it's in the movies or you, you hear it on the news, you know, the guy's a hero. I, I just saw uh, this guy uh, get into an accident. Uh, this car, he was putting gas in his car. This car came by, hit the gas pumps, just started a fire. The guy jumped out of his car and ran as quickly as he could. A police officer saw what was going on. The person was still in the car, and so he jumps to the car, opens the doors, trying to pull the guy out. And as soon as he gets him out, boom, the whole thing just blew up. You know, hero. You think that guy was appreciative? Of course he was. He was very glad that that guy risked his life for him so that he could have life. Jesus did that for us by his blood on the cross. How much is your soul worth? How much is your soul worth? What are you willing to sell yourself for? What are you willing to sell yourself for? For a little fun? Are you going to get anything out of that? Because you have a little bit of fun? 
Maybe because you're drunk a little bit and you feel tipsy and you get that little buzz, you know, and you're like, wow, everything's cool. But then you wake up in the morning. Did you really get anything out of it? Not really. I used to drink. <clears throat> I was what you call a, a social drinker. I never really drank alone. But I always had beer in my fridge when people came over and then we drank. I, I would drink with them until they left. You know, but it was also a prideful thing because I didn't want to be that individual that couldn't drink. And so I drank just to show them I could drink and I can drink better than they could drink. You know, and there were times where, where, <laughs> where it was all just a facade. And I can remember having cups of beer in my hand and drinking with the guys. I'm like, come on, one more, you know, one more. And as soon as they turn their back, shh, dump it out the, in the side, you know. I was like, hey, give me another one. Like, what? You're already done? Yeah, give me another one. As soon as they turn around, shh, dump it. Like, give me another one. Man, this guy can drink. You know, it's all garbage. What was I doing? I wasn't getting anything. What? They liked me? They gave me more beer, you know? Nothing. What is our soul worth? Jesus said your soul's worth his son. And so he sent his son to die on the cross for you. You're the apple of his eye. You're more precious than any ruby or diamond um, than anything. That's how precious you are. That's how much your soul's worth, that Jesus would pay the ransom for your soul because you've been kidnapped by Satan and told all these lies, and yet people sell their souls readily and get nothing. Get nothing. For what? You know, for what? You know, you think about Bill Gates or, or even, um, what's his name from Apple? Um, you think about all the money they made and um, all the times that they had with uh, that money, you know, good times and so forth. But yet, right now, as he passed away with the prostate cancer and so forth, I think it was prostate cancer, you know, what did he get? What did he get? Nothing. He separated from God for eternity. And yet he had all that money that he could have done something with for the kingdom of God. But nothing at all. I heard it was J.C. Penney's that when he um, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart, he told the Lord that you get 10%. No, actually, he told the Lord, you get 90%. I'm going to live on 10%. That was his promise to the Lord. And so he gave 90% of his money went to the kingdom of God. He lived on 10%. He lived a wealthy life. That 10% was enough to give him more than what he really needed. And yet we struggle with the opposite, don't we? Because yeah. we don't trust in the Lord. Yeah. That he's able to provide for us. What is your soul worth? Jesus knows what it's worth. Now, he definitely knows what it's worth. For thus says the Lord. You're, you know what? If your daughter or your son was dying and needed a lung or a blood transfusion... Which one of you would not give them that lung or transfusion? None of you would do that because you know how much they're worth to you, right? You'd be willing to give your right arm to save your son or your daughter. You don't let anything happen to them because you love them and value them so much. And so does God. So he gave his son for you. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at first into Egypt to dwell there. Then the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away from nothing? Those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord. My name is blasphemy continually every day. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. Of course, they're Babylonian captivity. The Assyrians took them, Babylonian taken them, but God is still the same. I'm here. I'm not going to leave you. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace and brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. I think of Anna, who was waiting for the salvation of the Lord, waiting for it, and then Jesus comes and she sees the salvation of the Lord. Good tidings, that's the good news that it's talking about there. Jesus here, the Savior of the world has come. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices, with their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. 
He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Again, future event. This will happen one day. Depart, depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Boy, do you hear him? Can you hear the voice of God right there? Depart, depart. Go out from there. What are you doing with the world? He redeemed you from the world. He pulled you out of the pit. And we want to go back to the pit? What did Peter say about that? Like a dog going back to what? It's vomit. That's gross when you think about it. I see my my little snowball, that little poodle that I have at my house, white fluffy little thing. Once in a while, she'll just throw up. And then she does the grossest thing. It's like, oh, snowball, then you want to come over here and lick my face? I don't think so. Get out of here. And, she's not, and she, you know, I don't know what it is. I think it's just poodles. Poodles, they want to lick you no matter what. And I got to tell her, uh, you know, I go, don't. And she's got, you know, I'm like, leave it, leave it. And she'll stop. And as soon as they get close, she'll lick me out. Like, you just licked up your vomit, and now you're going to lick me out? No, I don't think so. That's what Peter says we do when we go back to this world. Now, Paul understood the scripture that Isaiah was speaking about because he wrote about it in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 14. Let me just remind you of it. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What are you doing hanging around unbelievers? Now, I can understand you're hanging around them because you're being light and you're being salt. That's why you're hanging around them. You want to share Jesus because you love them enough and don't want to see them go to hell. Can you imagine if you were hanging around them for the other reasons? Because they're nice and you want to party with them or, or just be friends or, you know, but not share Christ with them? And can you imagine dying and then seeing them? Imagine what they would say to you. You knew and you didn't tell me anything. Why didn't you tell me? At least you could have said something. Maybe I could have, you know, who knows? I might have repented if you would have said something. But you didn't say anything to me. But we want to just hang around them. I can understand you hanging around them to share with them the gospel message. But any other other reason than that is just going to bring you down. And that's why he says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What does righteousness have to do with lawlessness? What does communion have? Uh, what and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal, which is a false god? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. That's straight from God's mouth. Do you hear him? Be separate from them. Come out from them. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Uh, What's the alternative? If you are partaking of them, if you are touching them, if you're into idolatry and so forth, that he will not receive you? I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Same thing what Isaiah said. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who he, who bear the vessels of the Lord, because you are the temple of God. When I was in Catholicism, that was one of the scriptures that that really convicted me. Because in Catholicism, you, you pray to statues. You can actually go into the church, very dim-lighted, and you can go over to one area, and there's a saint, and you have little candles and a little kneeling bench. And you can go over and light a candle and kneel on the bench and say, St. Nicholas, can you help me over here? And then you can go to the other side, light another little candle, and they're in little red jars or little tall jars, and then you can bow down and you can pray again. You can perform sacraments and and all these various things. And when I read this, when God says, come out from among them, don't be a part of that no more. Separate yourself from them. And so I left it because they were into idolatry. And what does God have to do with idols? 
They think they're worshiping Jesus in these services, but at the same time they're worshiping these statues of saints and Mary and so forth. God's not there. Separate yourselves from that. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. You see, the heart of God is not necessarily to try to get you out of places because they're no good for you, but he's trying to get into your heart because he's good for you. Look, I will be your father. I will be your God. I will be your mighty Lord. I will be with you if you get out of those places. And how much more power and strength and joy and peace will you have when you have me? Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Who's that speaking of? The Lord Jesus, right? He was marred. His face was disfigured, bruised and beaten because he loved you. That's the servant of the Lord. Astonished. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Sprinkling was often associated with uh, cleansing of sin in the Old Testament. Uh, a type of you'll be washed and you'll be pure. And so he will sprinkle his blood is, is what washes our sins away, right? Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what has not been told, then they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Again, you'll see. He said, no, it's not happening. Not until the Christian Messiah comes back. Not until he comes back. And then they will see. They will see him returning in the clouds with great power. Great power will come. So, call to action. Do you hear God's heart beating for you? He loves us that much.